Hi everyone, welcome to Medicine for Dummies. I'm Dr. V. Welcome to the second video on acquired heart diseases. Before you begin, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and let me know in the comments below if you need any other topic covered. Today, our topic is infective endocarditis. This is a common adult as well as pediatric condition and can have a lot of devastating sequelae, therefore it should be known thoroughly. Infective endocarditis, simply put, is an infection inside the heart that causes inflammation. Usually, this causes infection of the valves and things called vegetations to develop on top of the valves. In simple terms, it is a ball of bacteria that develop on top of the valves. Infective, as you know, means due to infection. Endo means within. Cardiac means relating to the heart and itis means inflammation. First, to recognize the disease, we should know the signs and symptoms of infective endocarditis. One of the commonest features are fever. Infective endocarditis is actually a cause for pyrexia of unknown origin. Basically, that means chronic fever that may not have an evident cause on preliminary investigation. The next thing is splenomegaly. The spleen is an organ in our abdomen concerned with certain functions such as immune function and degradation of cells. In infective endocarditis, you can get congestion of this organ, which can be a cause for its enlargement. Other causes for splenomegaly in infective endocarditis can be abscess formation and infarction and related edema. Another sign you can get is petechiae. This appears as a rash on the skin with small red patches that are often less than one millimeter. This is one of the features of endovascular phenomena seen in this condition. Endovascular infection causes bursting of small vessels and necrosis causing petechiae. Weight loss, malaise, and night sweats are some of the constitutional symptoms of infective endocarditis. Cerebral embolization occurs when the bacteria from the vegetations dislodge and travel through the heart and aorta to the carotid vessels and the brain. It causes multiple abscesses to develop in the brain or cause infarction of the related area. This is one of the features of distant infection caused by infective endocarditis. You can also get septic arthritis, meningitis, and abscesses in other organs by the same principle. Vasculitic phenomena are Janeway lesions and splinter hemorrhages, which will be discussed in the examination. You can also get changing cardiac murmurs in infective endocarditis during the duration of the illness. The cause for this is that the commonly present regurgitation murmurs tend to disappear when the illness progresses. This is because the more destruction the valve has, the incompetence becomes so severe that the turbulence to the blood flow is minimal, causing the disappearance of the murmur. Hematuria can be seen when there are renal infarctions due to embolization. The cause for anemia could be twofold. The first is when blood travels through damaged valves, it causes destruction of the red cells, causing hemolytic anemia. The second cause is due to anemia of chronic disease. A late feature usually seen in subacute infective endocarditis is clubbing, where there is bulbous enlargement of the ends of the fingers or toes. This is due to vascular proliferation in the nail beds. This is commonly seen in chronic infections involving the heart and lungs. The exact mechanism of development of clubbing is unknown, but the secretion of growth factors from chronically hypoxic tissue may be one method. There are many risk factors for this condition. Abnormal valves, either caused by congenital abnormalities or acquired damage, are more prone to harbor bacteria. 
Also, long-term intravascular catheters such as those used for dialysis can be a portal for infection. IV drug abuse, especially with shared needles, can introduce bacteria. In congenital heart disease, where there is mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, there is more chance of bacteria to persist and cause infection. This is because lungs usually act as filters for bacteria with their inherent macrophages and other antimicrobial properties. Immunocompromised patients are more at risk because they have less defense mechanisms in their bodies and previous endocarditis damages the valves and therefore makes the valves more prone to further attacks. During tattooing, if the needles are not cleaned properly, there is a chance of being infected. Infective endocarditis gives rise to many sequelae. A few of them were discussed before, such as embolization, which causes infarction and distant abscess formation. It can also cause rupture of valves, causing acute, severe incompetence of valves, leading to heart failure. Another complication is glomerular nephritis, which is when the glomeruli of the kidneys become clogged with immune complexes that form as a defense mechanism to the infection. All these have to be inquired in the history to get a good idea of the condition of the patient. After obtaining a thorough history, we should move on to the examination. There are some unique features seen such as rot spots on ophthalmoscopic examination. This is due to retinal capillary rupture and intraretinal hemorrhages and is proposed to be due to immunological phenomena. Splinter hemorrhages are again a result of capillary rupture, but these are vasculitic phenomena. Osler's nodes are also due to immunological phenomena. These are painful lesions that occur on the fingertips. Janeway lesions are due to vasculitic phenomena, where septic microemboli cause rupture of vessels and small infractions. These usually occur in the palms and soles and are non-painful. The causative organism for infective endocarditis depends on whether it is acute or subacute and the mode of infection but the most common organisms are viridin streptococci, alpha hemolytic streptococci, and staph aureus. To diagnose the condition, we do a few basic investigations such as a full blood count, which will show increased neutrophils and total white blood cell counts, as well as ESR and CRP, which will both be elevated. The UFR may show red cells due to renal infarction and resulting hematuria. The main line of investigation is by taking three blood cultures from three different sites at three different times with the fever spikes, and also by doing a 2D echo to see vegetations on the valves. After carrying out all these investigations, we come to a diagnosis by combining all the findings in the history, examination, and investigations. The criteria we use are the modified Duke's criteria given here. There are a set of major criteria and minor criteria. Major criteria includes a positive blood culture with an organism well known to cause infective endocarditis and endocardial involvement as evidenced by vegetations in a 2D echo. Minor criteria is having predisposing factors such as congenital heart diseases or damaged valves, having fever, having vascular phenomena we talked about earlier such as embolization or Janeway lesions, having immunologic phenomena such as osphorus nodes or rot spots, and microbiologic evidence that doesn't come into the major criteria. This could be a blood culture positive for an organism rarely causing the disease. To come to a diagnosis of infective endocarditis, we have to have either two major criteria, one major and three minor criteria, or all five minor criteria. After we have come to a diagnosis, we must manage the patient swiftly to avoid further complications. The mainstay is a long duration of antibiotics. 
It could be with a third generation cephalosporin for four weeks or high dose penicillin aminoglycoside combination for six weeks. This can further be guided by antibiotic sensitivity studies from cultures. You can also give supportive therapy such as to manage heart failure and manage and prevent any complications of the disease that may occur. One of the most important parts of management is giving prophylaxis to patients who are at risk of developing endocarditis. These are people with prosthetic valves, a previous history of endocarditis, cardiac valvulopathy, and congenital heart disease. Earlier, when doing dental procedures, antibiotic prophylaxis was recommended, but now it is not recommended. Now, we only give antibiotics to patients who undergo invasive procedures concerning the respiratory tract. Then, of course, we have to give health education to maintain dental hygiene because a lot of the causative organisms are harbored in the mouth and they can enter the bloodstream easily if the hygiene is poor. So, that is everything you need to know about infective endocarditis. We will be talking about Kawasaki disease in the next video. Thanks for watching!